Now I would request uh, Shivanti Tadwal. Uh, she needs no introduction, but there are some people who are here from outside, so they may know just one thing. She is a research fellow with the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis, specializing in energy, security, and climate-related issues. In, 19, in 2002, she published a book, Rethinking Energy Security in India, and is now working on the politics of energy and climate change. Shibanti. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think my paper is going to read like a corollary to the previous speakers, Dr. Pant, and he was my supervisor, so uh, many of our... our our uh, thinking, I think, kind of converge. Anyway, to come to the paper, uh, in the preceding panels, while energy has been mentioned by several of the speakers, it has generally been mentioned only in passing. And in my presentation, I will attempt to uh, fill the gap and I will also look at the implications of the Arab um, uprising or the Arab Spring or the Arab churning uh, fr through the prism of energy. Now, for India, of course, energy considerations are uh, one of, if not the most important issues that ties it to the West Asian region. Um, just a minute. Um, after all, five of its top seven oil sources are from the West Asian region, namely Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait, UAE, and Iran. Secondly, as we all know, the West Asian region holds about 61% of the world's conventional oil reserves, around 816 billion barrels of oil, and 20% of them are in Saudi Arabia alone. Thirdly, the region also produces a third of the world's total production, not just reserves, but also production, and exports the bulk of it, that is around 40% of global oil exports. <clears throat> However, more importantly, the region, by and large, barring a few countries like Oman, have the lowest cost of production of energy. And uh, I'd like you to remember this graph, I mean, not really look at it, but just remember it because I will be coming back to this uh, point later. Fourthly, Three of the countries in the region, namely Saudi Arabia, UAE and Kuwait, have excess or spare capacity, which can be brought into production when and if the need arises. But Saudi Arabia alone plays the role of a swing producer when required, which can bring in extra barrels into production at very short notice. Of course, not all the countries in the region produce or export oil, but all of them are dependent on the revenues that accrue from oil sales from the trade, remittances and commodity price channels with the energy exporting countries and many of them receive substantial grants and foreign direct investment from other states in the region. And it is in this context that I shall place the recent developments in the region. Now, although the recent Arab uprisings are not the first time that the, uh, that the region has experienced tumult, neither is it going to be the last, the developments that have emerged from the Arab Spring uh, may have larger and far-reaching implications for the oil market. Clearly, therefore, the developments that led to the phenomenon um, has great significance for India as well as for the world. In the past, whenever conflict in the region has taken place, it has affected oil production, that is the Iranian crisis from 51 to 54, which resulted in the loss of about 924 million barrels the 90 to 91 crisis, in, uh, the Kuwait crisis, which took 421 million barrels off the market, and the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, which affected 1 billion barrels of oil. But these, but other than a relatively uh, brief increase in price, none of these incidents actually affected supplies per se, mainly due to other regional producers increasing output to make up for the lost barrels. The reality is that prices go up for other reasons namely speculation in the futures market, which push up prices in the belief that a shortage in physical supplies may be imminent due to various reasons, ranging from lack of timely investment in the face of growing demand and no concurrent production taking place, both within and outside OPEC, political turmoil in some producing countries, possibly conflict, 
like the Iran, uh, US, uh, Israel standoff, etc. Hence, it is this disconnect between actual physical supplies and the futures market is often the main reason for the volatility that takes place in oil prices. Nonetheless, the current wave of unrest in, the, in this region is causing concern about the medium and long-term impact of the uprisings, and this is worrying the oil markets. This, is what, this graph shows what impact it had on prices, and the reasons for this are varied. First, the uncertainty surrounding the continuity of the current dispensation in the region. I'm talking about the medium and the long-term impact. As has been mentioned several times by various speakers uh, in, over the, uh, yesterday, the Arab street has lost its fear of the regimes and are increasingly registering the disillusionment and demanding far more accountability and inclusion. Secondly, the U.S. retreat from the region, which is still debatable to my mind, will have a bearing on the region's behavior. In other words, there's very likelihood of more uncertainty prevailing. All this is going to have an impact on investment. No doubt in the past, despite the region's troubled politics, international oil companies have continued to invest as they have in other troubled energy-rich uh, regions, but this time there are other reasons why the international oil companies may be less inclined to invest here. One is, of course, the pub the persistent economic recession in Europe and the U.S., and two, the advent of the fracking technology that has made shale oil and gas more competitive vis-à-vis -vis conventional oil. The IOCs, that is including Exxon, Mobil, Royal Dutch Shell and Chevron, are also investing in shale oil and may be less inclined to invest in conventional oil, particularly in a region that is politically volatile. At the same time, many of the countries with large oil and gas reserves conventional reserves are reducing the share of foreign participation. For instance, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, which a uh, short while ago were toying with the idea of opening up their oil sectors to foreign investment, have yet to do so, are now taking a back seat again. While Russia, while energy nationalism in other countries like Russia and the Latin American countries um, Privatized their oil industries, who have privatized their oil industries, have now decided to recreate their national oil companies. Now, but the national oil companies do not have the technical know-how to explore in difficult blocks, and increasingly, the residual oil in the rest of the world, the conventional oil, is in deep offshore and very, very technically difficult um, geological formations. And this could have an impact on production and supplies, and therefore, of course, prices. But the twin combination of economic recession and shale oil has not allowed prices to soar as could have happened, given the conflict in the region, as well as the U.S.-Israel-Iran standoff. Prices of Brent have therefore been hovering around 110 plus WTI, a little less, uh, for the last few weeks. The point is, are they going to go up or are they going to come down? There are predictions that some predictions that they will come down, some predictions that they might soar. It all depends on who's saying what and for what agenda. If they come down, the West Asian region could face that the countries could face unprecedented problems with far reaching consequences, including further regime changes. Due, of course, to the greater spending and which we've just heard about, to placate their rest of populations, as well as to increase production to meet increases in domestic domestic oil consumption which has increased year on year uh, due to the subsidized pricing in the energy sector, <coughs> and to counter falling prices, the producers could resort to cutting production. But this would allow other oil producers to further take away their market share. So this is a dilemma that the West Asian countries all suffer from, the producing oil producing countries. Alternatively, especially Saudi Arabia, could flood the market with cheap oil, as they have done several times in the past, while, of course, this would render other producers of both conventional and unconventional oil unproductive, it would also impact on the economies of the Arab states. According to the IEA, the West Asian countries require a price of around $100 per barrel. Saudi Arabians might need it a little less uh, to maintain their budget expenditures. Low prices would also affect production and supply in the long run, as we saw in the late 1990s. Moreover, given that most of the countries have not succeeded in diversifying their economies away from the oil and energy sectors, they remain dependent on their own revenues accruing from oil and therefore higher prices. 
Moreover, as a December IEA report said, Saudi Arabia has been cutting production, not necessarily to bolster prices, but due to increased domestic consumption. Actually, they've been cutting exports sometimes at the onset of summer. The following graph will show you how Saudi Arabia is amongst the top consumers of oil, top 10 consumers of oil in the world. Um, so what are the implications? Prices, of course, will remain in the middling. Today, of course, what was a high, uh, a $70 per barrel price was considered high today, $100 is something that one has grown to expect. It's certainly not going to come back to the 20s and the 30s. Gone are the days of low oil prices. So despite shale oil, producers um, require higher prices to remain solvent. And as the chart earlier, I showed you that the price, the production price of shale, shale oil and gas is going to be, they need a price of about 60 to $65 at least for them to remain remunerative. While the U.S. remains the largest consumer of oil, its recent shale revolution has seen its imports falling. On the other hand, Asian countries have registered largest growth in terms of oil demand as well as imports. India, of course, is currently the fourth largest importer of oil and it soon, say, and according to projections, will soon become the third largest. Its demand for oil is growing year on year, while its domestic production <coughs> is growing only marginally. This increasing shortfall is being met largely from imports from West Asia, which accounts for about two-thirds of uh, our oil uh, imports, and this dependence is going to continue. Therefore, any increases in crude prices can affect the government's fiscal calculations. A rise in international oil price translates to, of course, a higher import bill, worsens our terms of trade, which results in a deterioration in our trade balance. Now, India's trade deficit reached a record level of $185 billion in 2011-12, and this is around 9 to 10% of India's GDP. Import of oil and petrol products at the rate of about $150 billion, and gold and silver at about $60 billion accounted for more than 40% of India's total imports of $485 billion. Hence, one of the main reasons for India's current account deficit is its burgeoning oil as well as gold imports, of course. But the government has initiated some kind of steps in curbing gold imports. It cannot do the same for oil imports because of its impact on overall growth, although the fuel subsidies have also contributed to rising oil demand. Of course, India has the option of diversifying away from West Asia, but it's unlikely to do so. After all, given the homogeneous nature of uh, the oil market, uh, there is not going to be any major changes in price wherever we get our oil from, really, um, especially from the spot markets. On the other hand, India can leverage its position as a large and growing consumer of energy to form and strengthen bilateral term deals to ensure long-term supplies and gain price advantages. Nonetheless, India should try and correct our trade balance imbalance that it faces with the Gulf energy exporting countries. We've seen the problems that this creates vis-a-vis -vis payments with Iran in the recent past. And uh, we should therefore try to address this problem by moving away from the current energy-based buyer-seller arrangement to a more substantial one that is based on cross-investments and joint ventures in each other's economies and across sectors, especially energy. An example, for, uh, example is uh, the refining sector, for instance. We are emerging as a refining hub, several uh, state-of-the-art refineries being set up, and this is in contrast to the kind of uh, the situation in the refining uh, sector in many of the developed countries. This is going to allow India access to much required investments in its energy and infrastructure sectors, and it will also allow the West Asian countries to not only invest in emerging markets, but also diversify the energy partnerships eastward. We could make this, the events that are, are arising from the unfortunate uh, incidents that have taken place, into a win-win situation if we take a really a long-term view. Given uh, that with oil demand in developed countries decreasing and new non-Arab oil also entering the market, the traditional oil exporting countries would require secure oil markets, and India is certainly one of them. 
Finally, India should explore whether it could assist in ensuring secure transport of supplies through turbulent sea lanes and choke points and the threat of piracy, particularly in the event of a diminished U.S. presence in the region. After all, given that notwithstanding its energy diversification strategy, the West Asian region will remain its most important and largest energy supplier in the foreseeable future, and it's therefore in its interest to contribute towards the region's security. Thank you for your attention.